Now 10 a.m. sharp, and I am finally on time today for my second reading of Natsume Soseki's I Am a Cat. Wagahai ga neko de aru. Today we are going to be reading, continue reading chapter, uh, volume one. Okay, it for those who do not know, um. I am, Natsume Sosaki's I Am A Cat is published in three volumes and the book that uh, you can find commonly is um, of um, three volumes in a single book and it's a giant of a book it's really really like really giant of a book so we are currently still in volume 1 chapter 2 uh, previously I stopped around the maybe like a few pages into chapter two so unfortunately for those viewers who are new to the stream um unfortunately you'll 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 miss some of the story from the beginning but i do have the vod uh, saved in my Twitch channel, so you can feel free to go um, Feel free to go read it, uh, I mean, uh, listen to it And um, To make sure that we will not have any disturbances um, we are going to switch off the background music and also performances in case someone try to like interrupt or be noisy. I'm going to put voices down low as well. Um, and uh, the today's setting will be this. Uh, we are here at Dian's house. Thank you very much for attending. Hello, Flea Narcana. Nice to meet you. Thank you for attending uh, my reading session. I re I'm really, really grateful for this. Um, and if we are ready, we are going to start at 10.05 a.m. Okay? We have two minutes to go. So grab your drinks. Uh, I hope you have tea. Today, I chose a uh, genmai cha, which is roasted rice green tea, and it's very tasty. And I also have my morning coffee, so it's very nice as well. Uh, I would really appreciate if uh, Coco would sit down properly on the chair. Um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um... Okay, we have st we still have two minutes to go, right? Okay, someone just joined the voice channel. Good morning, Bit. Uh, I know that you can't be here in game, but I know you are here in spirit, and that is good enough. That is entirely great enough. Thank you so much for supporting my little weird thing. Where I read to people, okay? Um, I really appreciate you guys. Uh, okay, I'm gonna find a good angle where I can like see people while I read. What do you think? Should I be pointing at my face or pointing at you all? Opinions. Opinions. Doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll be selfish. I'll point to myself. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think it's nicer to like to to see that there are actually people uh here listening. <laughs> 
Uh, also, my in real life cat is in my room currently, so occasionally you will be hearing uh, meow, 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 meow. and um, yeah. All right, it's ten o five. We're gonna start reading right now. Okay, once again, thank you for everyone who attended this little reading session. I really appreciate it. We are at page 28 of chapter 2 in volume 1 of Natsume Soseki's I Am a Cat. I doubt whether this sake treatment will, ke will be kept up for very long. My master's mind exhibits the same incessant changeability as can be seen in the eyes of cats. He has no sense of perseverance. It is moreover idiotic that while he feels his diary lamentations over his stomach troubles he does his best to present a brave face to the world to green and bear it the other day his scholar friend professor what not paid a visit and advanced the theory that it was at least arguable that every illness in the direct result of both ancestral and personal malefaction he seemed to have studied the matter pretty deeply for a sequence of his logic was clear, consistent, and orderly. Altogether, it was fine. It was a fine theory. I am sorry to say that my master has neither the brain nor the erudition to rebut such theories. However, perhaps because he himself was actually suffering from a stomach tr trouble, he felt obliged to make all sorts of face-saving excuses. He irrelevantly he irre <laughs> irre 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 retorted. Your theory is interesting, but are you aware of Carlyle was dyspeptic? As if claiming because Carlyle was dyspeptic, his own dyspepsia was an intellectual honor. His friend replied, It does not follow that Carlyle was dyspeptic. All dyspeptics are Carlyle's. My master reprimanded held his tongue but the incident revealed his curious vanity it's all the more amusing when one recalls that he would probably prefer not to be dyspeptic but just this morning he recorded in his diary an intention to take the treatment by sake as from tonight now that i've come to think of it his inordinate consumption of rice cakes this morning must have been the effect of last night's sake sessions with Cold Moon. I could have eaten this, those cakes myself. Though I am a cat, I eat practically anything. Unlike Rickshaw Blackie, I lack the energy to go off raiding fish shops at distance alleys. Further, my social status is such that I cannot expect the luxury enjoyed by Tortoise Shell, whose mistress teaches the idle rich to play on the two-string harp. Therefore, I don't, as others can, indulge myself in the likes and dislikes. I, I eat small bits of bread left over by the children, and I lick the jam from the bean jam cakes. Pickles taste awful! But to broaden my experience, I once tried a couple of slices of pickled radish. It's strange to say, it's just it's a strange thing, but once I've tried it, almost anything turns out edible. To say I don't like that or I don't like this is merely extravagant willfulness, and a cat that lives in a teacher's house should eschew such foolish remarks. According to my master, there was once a novelist whose name was Balzac, and he lived in France. He was an extremely extravagant man. I do not mean an extravagant eater, but that, being a novelist, he was extravagant in his writing. One day, he was trying to find a suitable name for a character in the novel he was writing, but for whatever reason, could not think of a name that pleased him. Just then, one of his friends called by, and Balzac suggested that they should go out for a walk. This friend had, of course, no idea why. Still, less that Balzac 
was determined to find the name he needed. Out on the streets, Balzac did nothing but stare at shop signboards, but still he couldn't find a suitable name. He marched on endlessly, while his puzzled friend, still ignorant of the object of the expedition, tagged along behind him. Having fruitlessly explored Paris from morning till evening, they were on their way home when Balzac happened to notice a tailor's signboard bearing the name Marcus. He clapped his hands. This is it, he shouted. It just has to be this. Marcus is a good name. But with a Z in front of the Marcus, it became a perfect name. It has to be Z, Z, Marcus. Is remark- SVZ. Z Marcus remark- is remarkably good. Names that I invent are never good. They sound so unnatural, however cleverly constructed. But now, at long last, I've got a name that I like. Balzac, extremely pleased with himself, was totally oblivious to the inconvenience he had caused his friend. It would seem unduly troublesome that one should have to spend a whole day trudging around Paris merely to find a name for a character in a novel. Extravagance of such enormity acquires a certain splendor, but folk like me, a cat, kept by a clam-like introvert, cannot even envisage such inordinate behavior. That I should not much care what, so long as it's edible, I eat, is probably an inevitable result of my circumstances. Thus, it was in no way an expression of extravagance that I expressed just now, my feeling of wishing to eat a rice cake. I simply thought that I would better eat what the chance offered. Then, I remembered that the piece of rice cake which my master had left in his breakfast bowl was possibly still in the kitchen, so round to the kitchen I went. The rice cake was stuck, just as I saw it this morning, at the bottom of the bowl and its colour was still as I remembered it. I must confess that I have never previously tasted rice cakes. Yet, though I felt a shade uncertain, it looks quite good to eat. With a tentative front paw, I rake at the green vegetable adhering to the rice cake. My claws, having touched the outer part of the rice cake, become sticky. I sniff at them and recognize the smell that can be smelt when rice stuck at the bottom of a cooking pot is transferred to the boiled rice container. I look around, wondering, shall I eat it? Shall I not? Fortunately, or unfortunately, there's nobody about. Osang, with a face that shows no change between year end and the spring, is playing Battle Dorian Shuttlecock. The children in the inner room are singing something about a rabbit and a tortoise. If I am to eat this New Year specialty, now's the moment. If I miss this chance, I shall have to spend a whole long year not knowing how a rice cake tastes. At this point, though, a mere cat, I perceive a truth that golden opportunity makes all animals venture to do even those things they do not want to do. To tell the truth, I do not particularly want to eat the rice cake. In fact, the more I examined the thing at the bottom of the bowl, the more nervous I became and the more keenly in this I to eat it. If only Osang would open the kitchen door, or if I could hear the children's footstep coming towards me, I would unhesitatingly abandon the bowl. Not only that, I would have put away all thoughts of rice cakes for another year. But no one comes. I've hesitated long enough. Still, no one comes. I feel as if someone were partly urging me on, someone whispering, Eat it, quickly. I look into the ball and pray that someone would appear, but no one did. I shall have to eat the rice cake after all. In the end, lowering the entire weight of my body into the bottom of the bowl, I beat about 
an inch deep into the corner of the rice cake. Most things I bite that hard comes off clean off in my mouth. But what a surprise for I found when I tried to reopen my jaw, it would not budge. I try once again to bite my way free, but I find myself stuck. Too late, I realize that the rice cake is a fiend. When a man who has fallen into a marsh struggles to escape, the more he trashes about, trying to extract his legs, deeper in he sinks. Just so, the harder I clamp my jaws, the more my mouth grows heavy and my teeth immobilize. I can feel the resistance to my teeth, but that's all. I cannot dispose of it. Waver House, the estate, once described my master as an elegant man, and I must say, it's a rather good description. This rice cake too, like my master, is elegant. I look at it looked to me, however much I continued biting, nothing could ever result. The process could go on and on eternally, like a division of ten by three. In the middle of this anguish, I found my second truth, that all animals can tell by instinct what is or is not good for them. Although I have now discovered two great truths, I remain unhappy by reason of the adherent rice cake. My teeth are being sucked into its body and are becoming excruciatingly painful. Unless I can complete my bite and run away quickly, all sound will be on me. The children seem to have stopped singing and I'm sure they'll soon come running into the kitchen. In an, extreme, in an extremity of anguish, I lash about my tail, but to no effect. I made my ears stand up and then lie flat, but this didn't help either. Come to think of it, my ears and tail have nothing to do with the rice cake. In short, I had indulged in a waste of wagging, a waste of ear erection, and a waste of ear flattening, so I stopped. At long last, it dawned on me that the best thing to do is to force the rice cake down by using my two front paws. First, I raised my, front, my right paw and stroke it around my mouth. Naturally, this merely stroking brought no relief whatsoever. Next, I stretch out my left paw with its, with its scrape quickly circles around my mouth. This, intellect, in, this ineffectual passes failed to exercise the fiend in the rice cake. Realizing that it was essential to proceed with patience, I scraped alternatively with my right and left paws, but my teeth stayed stuck in the rice cake. Growing impatient, I now use both my front paws simultaneously. Then, only then, I found to my amazement that I could actually stand up on my hind legs. Somehow, I feel uncat like but not caring whether I am a cat or not. I scratch away like mad at my whole face in frenzied determination to keep on scratching until the fiend in the rice cake has been driven out since the movements of my front paws are, are so vigorous, I'm in danger of losing my balance and falling down. To keep my equilibrium, I find myself marking time with my hind legs. I begin to tit up from one spot to another, and I finish up prancing madly all over the kitchen. It gives me great pride to realize that I can so dexterously maintain an upright position, and the revelation of a third great truth is thus vouchsafed me that in conditions of exceptional danger, one can surpass one's normal level of achievement. This is the real meaning of special providence. Sustained by special providence, I am fighting for dear life against the demonic rice cake when I hear footsteps. One second. Someone seems to be approaching. Thinking it would be fatal to be caught in this predicament, I redoubled my efforts and I am positively running around the kitchen. The footsteps came closer and closer. A last special providence seems not to last forever. 
In the end, I am discovered by the children who loudly shout, Why, look, the cat's been eating rice cakes and is dancing. The first thing to hear the announcement was that old sang person abandoning her shuttercock and battle door. She flew in through the kitchen door crying, Gracious me! Then, the mistress sedate in her formal silk kimono designs a remark, What a naughty cat! And my master, drawn from his study by the general hub hub, shouts, You fool! The children find me funniest. But by the general agreement, the whole household is having a good old laugh. It's annoying. It's painful. It's impossible to stop dancing. Hell and damnation. When at long last the laughter began to die down, the dear little five-year-old piped up with an, Oh, what a comical cat! Which had the effect of renewing the tide of their ebbing laughter. They fairly split their sides. I have already heard and seen quite a lot of heartless human behavior, but never before have I felt so bitterly critical of their conduct. Special providence. Having vanquished into thin air, I was back in my customary positions on all fours. Finally, at my wit's end and by reason of giddiness, cutting quite a ridiculous figure. My master seems to have felt it would have it would be, perhaps, a pity to let me die before his very eyes, for he said to Osang, Help him get rid of that rice cake. Osang looked at the mistress as if to say, Why not make him go on dancing? The mistress would gladly see my minuet continue, but since she would not go so far as wanting me to dance myself to death, says nothing. My master turned somewhat sharply to the servant and ordered, Hurry up! If you don't quick help quickly, the cat will be dead. <gasps> Hello, Miyaboshi! <laughs> I know who you are. Thank you for dropping by. I'm so happy to see you. <sighs> okay, I want to continue now, okay? Osa, with a vacant look on her face as though she had Roughly wakened from some peculiarly delicious dream, took a grip, took a firm grip on the rice cake and yanked it out of my mouth. I'm not quite as feeble, fang as coal moon, but I really did think my entire front tooth was about to break off. The pain was indescribable. The teeth embedded in the rice cakes are being pitilessly wrenched. You can't imagine what it was like. It was then the fourth enlightenment burst upon me that all comfort is achieved through hardship. When at last I came to myself and looked around at the world restored to normality, all the members of the household had disappeared into the inner room. Having made such a fool of myself, I felt quite unable to face such hostile critics of Osan. It would, I think, unhinge my mind. To restore my mental tranquility, I decided to visit Tortishell. So, I left the kitchen and set off the, through the backyard to the house of the two-string harp Tortishell. Tortishell is a celebrated beauty in our district. Though I am undoubtedly a cat, I possess a wide general knowledge of nature of compassion and am deeply sensitive to affection, kind-heartedness, tenderness, and love. Merely to observe the bitterness in my master's face, just to be snubbed by all Osang leaves me out of sorts. At such time, I visit this fair lady friend of mine and our conversation ranges over many things. Then, before I am aware of it, I find myself refreshed. I forget my worries, hardships, everything, as if reborn. One second, please.
I was in need of hydration. All right, we shall continue. <laughs> All righty. <clears throat> Refreshed. I forget my worries, hardships, everything. I feel as if we're born. Female influence is indeed a most potent thing. Through a gap in the cedar edge, I peer to see if she's anywhere about. Tortoise shell wearing a smart new collar in celebration of the season is sitting very neatly on her veranda. The rondeur of her back is indescribably beautiful. It is the most beautiful of all curved lines. The way her tail curves. The way her tail curves. The way she folds her legs. The charmingly lazy shake of her ears. All these are quite beyond description. She looks so warm. Sitting there so gracefully. In the very sunniest spot. One second. Her body holds. Her body holds an attitude of utter stillness and correctness, and her fur, glossy as velvet that reflects the rays of spring, seems suddenly to quiver. Although the air is still, for a while. I stood, completely enraptured, gazing at her. Then I came to myself. I called softly, "Miss Tortishell, Miss Tortishell," and beckoned with my paw. Why, Professor? She greeted me as she stepped down from the veranda. A tiny bell attached to her scarlet collar made little tinkling sound. I say to myself, "Ah." It's for the new year. She's wearing a new bell, and while I'm still admiring its lively tinkle, finds she has arrived beside me. A happy new year, Professor! And she waves her tail le- to the left, for when cats exchange greetings, one first holds one's tail upright like a pole, and then twists it to the left, twists it round to the left. In our neighborhood, it is only Tarty Shell who calls me Professor. Now, I have mentioned that I have as yet no name. It is Tarty Shell, and she alone who pays me respect due to one that lives in the in a teacher's house. Indeed, I am not altogether displeased to be addressed as a professor, and respond willingly to her apostrophe. And a happy new year to you too, I say. How beautifully you are done up! Yes, the mistress bought it for me at the end of last year. Isn't it nice? And she made it tinkles for me. Yes, indeed, it has a lovely sound. I've never seen such a wonderful thing in my life. No, everyone's using them, and she tinkles, tinkles. But isn't it a lovely sound? I'm so happy. She tinkle, tinkle, tinkles continuously. I can see your mistress loves you very dearly. Comparing my lot with hers, I hinted at my envy of a pampered life. Tortoise shell is a simple creature. Yes, she says, that's true. She treats me as if I were her own child, and she laughs innocently. It is not true that cats never laugh. Human beings are mistaken in their belief that only they are capable of laughter. When I laugh. My nostril grows triangular, and my Adam's apple trembles. No wonder human beings fail to understand it. What's your master like? My master? That sounds strange. Mine's his mistress, a mistress of the high birth. Ah, yes. A small princess pine while waiting for you. 
Beyond the sliding paper door, mistress, the mistress begins to play on her two-string harp. Isn't that a splendid voice? Tortishell is proud of it. It seems extremely good, but I don't understand what she's singing. What's the name of the piece? That? Oh, it's called something or other. The mistress is especially fond of it. Do you know, she's actually 62. But in excellent condition, don't you think? I suppose one has to admit that she's in excellent condition if she's still alive at 62. So I answered, yes. I thought to myself that I had given a silly answer, but I could do no other than since I couldn't think of anything brighter to say. You may not think so, but she used to be a person of high standing. She always tells me so. What was she originally? I understand that she's the 13th shogun's widowed wife's private secretary's younger sister's husband's mother's nephew's daughter. Uh, what? The 13th shogun's widowed wife's private secretary's younger sister's... Ah, uh, but please, not quite so fast. Uh, the 13th Shogun's widowed wife's younger sister's private secretary's... No, no, no. The 13th Shogun's widowed wife's private secretary's younger sister's... The 13th Shogun's widowed wife, right? Private secretary's, right? Right? Husbands? No, no, no. Younger sister's husbands. Uh, of, of course, how could I? Uh, younger sister's husbands. Mother's, nephew's, daughter. There you go. Mother's, nephew's, daughter? Yes, you've got it. Not really. It's so terribly involved that I can't get the hang of it. What exactly is her relation to the 13th Shogun's widow's wife? Oh, but you're so stupid. I've just been telling you what she is. She's the 13th Shogun's widowed wife's private secretary's younger sister's husband's mother's... That's much... That's much I followed, but... Then you've got it, haven't you? Uh, yes. I had to give in. There are times for little white lies. Beyond the sliding paper door, the sound of the two-string harp came to a sudden stop and the mistress' voice called, Tortishell, Tortishell, your lunch is ready. Tortishell looked happy and remarked, There, she's calling, so I must go home. I hope you'll forgive me. What would be good of my saying that I mind? Come see me again, she said, and she ran off through the garden, tinkling her bell. But suddenly she turned and came back to ask me anxiously. You are looking far from well. Is anything wrong? I couldn't very well tell her that I had eaten a rice cake and gone dancing, so... No, I said. Nothing in particular. I did some weighty thinking, but which brought on something of a headache. Indeed, I called today because I fancied just to talk with you would help me feel better. Really? Well, take good care of yourself. Goodbye now. She seemed a tiny bit sorry to leave me, but which has, which has completely restored to me the, li the liveliness I felt before the rice cake beat me. I now felt wonderful and decided to go home through the tea plantation where one could have the pleasure of treading down lumps of half-melted frost. I put my face through the broken bamboo hedge and there was Ricky Black Rickshaw Blackie. Back again in the dry chrysanthemums, yawning his spine into high back arc. Nowadays, I'm no longer scared of Blackie, but since any conversations with him involve the risk of trouble, I endeavor to pass cutting him off. But it's not in Blackie's nature, nature to contain his feelings if he believes himself looked down upon. Hey you, Mr. No-Name, you're very stuck up these days, aren't you? 
You may be living in the teacher's house, but don't go giving yourself such airs. And stop, I warn you, trying to make a fool of me. Blackie doesn't seem to know that I am now a celebrity. I wish I could explain the situation to him, but since he's not the kind who can understand such things, I decided simply to offer him the briefest of greetings and then take my leave as soon as I decently can. A happy new year, Mr. Blackie. You do look well, as usual. And then lift up my tail and twist it to the left. Blackie kept... Kept, Sorry, Blackie, keeping his tail straight up, refused to return my salutation. <laughs> what? Happy? If the New Year's happy, then you should be out in your tiny mind the whole year round. Now push off, sharp, you back end of a bellows. That turn of phrase about the back end of bellows sounds distinctly derogatory, but its semantic contents happen to escape me. What? I inquired. Do you mean by the back end of a bellows? You're being sworn at and you stand there asking its meaning. I give up. I really do. You really are a New Year's nit. A New Year's nit sounds somewhat poetic, but its meaning is even more obscure than that bit of the bellows. I would have liked to ask the meaning for my future reference, but as it was obvious, i would get no clear answer. I just stood facing him without a word. I was actually feeling rather awkward. But just then, the wife of Blackie's master suddenly screamed out, Where in the hell is that cut of salmon I left here on the shelf? My god, I do declare that hell cat's been here and snitched it once again. That's the nastiest cat I've ever seen. See what he'll get when he comes back. Her raucous voice unceremoniously shakes the mild air of the season, vulgarizing its natural peacefulness. Blackie puts on an impudent look as if to say, If you want to scream your head off, scream it away. And he jerked his square chin forward to me as if to say, Did you hear that hullabaloo? Up to this point, I've been too busy talking to Blackie to notice or think about anything else, but now... Glancing down, I see between his legs a mud-covered bone from the cheapest cut of salmon. So you've been at it again! Forgetting our recent exchanges, I offered Blackie my usual flattering exclamation. But it was not enough to restore him to good humor. Been at it? What the hell do you mean, you saucy blockhead? What do you mean by saying again, when this is nothing but a skinny slice of the cheapest fish? Don't you know who I am? I'm Rickshaw Blackie, damn you! And having no shirt sleeves to roll up, he lifts an aggressive right front paw as if as high as his shoulder. Well, I've always known you were Mr. Rickshaw Blackie. If you knew, why the hell did you say I've been at it again? Answer me! And he blows out over me great gusts of oven breath. Were we humans, I would be shaken by the collar of my coat. I'm somewhat taken aback and I am indeed wondering how to get out of the situation when that woman's fearful voice is heard again. Hey, Mr. Westbrook, you there with Westbrook, can you hear me? Listen, I've got something to say. Bring me a pound of beef and quick, okay? Understand? Beef that isn't tough. A pound of it, see? Her beef demanding tone shattered the peace of the whole neighborhood. It's only once a year she orders beef and that's why she shouts it so loud. She wants the entire neighborhood to know about her marvelous pound of beef. What can one do with a woman like that? Asked Blackie jeeringly as he stretched all fours of his legs. As I can find nothing to say in reply, I kept silent and watched. A miserable pound is simply will, just simply will not do. But I reckon it can't be helped. Hang on to that beef. I'll have it later. But he communes with himself as though the beef had been ordered specially for him. This time, you are in for a real treat. 
That's wonderful. With these words, I'd hope I hope to pack him off to his home. But Blackie snarled. That's nothing to do with you. Just shut your big mouth, you. And using his strong hind legs, he suddenly scrabbles up a torrent of fallen icicles which thuds on my head. I was taken completely aback and while I was still busy shaking the muddy debris off my body, Blackie slid off through the edge and disappeared. Presumably to preserve himself of the Westbrook brief. When I get home, I find the place unusually spring-like, and even the master is laughing gaily. I wondering, I wonder why. I hop onto the veranda, and I, and as I padded to sit beside the master, I notice an unfamiliar guest. His hair is parted neatly, and he wears a crested cotton circlet and a duck, and a wait, sorry, cotton circlet and a duck cloth hakama. He looks like a student, and at that, an extremely serious one, lying on the corner of my master's small hand-warming brazier, right beside the lacquer secret box. There's a visiting card on the on, which is written, to introduce Mr. Beauchamp Blowlamb from Colmoon, which tells me both the name of this guest and the fact that he's a friend of Colmoon. The conversation going between the host and the guest sounds enigmatic because I missed the start of it. But I gather that it has something to do with Waver House, the estate whom I had previously occasion I had previous occasion to mention. Hydration one minute please. Thank you. Hello, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Hydration, hydration. <laughs> I need hydration. <laughs> Alright, I'm back. <clears throat> the guest is talking calmly. And he urged me to come along with him because it would involve an ingenious idea, he said. Do you mean there was some ingenious idea involved in lunching at a western-style restaurant? My master pours more tea for the guests and pushes the cup towards him. Well, at the time, I did not understand what this ingenious idea would be, but since it was his idea, I thought it would bound to be something interesting and... So you, you accompanied him, I see. Yes, but I got a surprise. The master, looking as if to say, I told you so, gives me a whack. 
gives me a whack on the head. Hmm, hang on. Which hurts a little. I expect it to I expect it proves somewhat far farcical. He's rather that way inclined. Clearly, he suddenly remembered that business of Andrea del Sato. Ah, yes. Well, he suggested we would be eating something special. What did you have? First of all, while studying the menu, he gave me all sort of information about food. Before ordering any? He, yeah. And then? And then, turning to the waiter, he said, There doesn't seem to be anything special on the card. <clears throat> the waiter, not to be outdone, suggested roast stack or veal chops. Whereupon, Waver House remarked quite sharply that we haven't come here for a very considerable distance just for a common or garden fair. The waiter who didn't understand the significance of common or garden, looked puzzled and said nothing. So I would imagine. Then, turning to me, Waver House observed that in France or in England, one could obtain an amount, obtain any amount of dishes cooked in a la tenme or a la magno. But in Japan, whenever, wherever you go, the food is all stereotyped. And, sorry, it's also stereotyped that one doesn't even feel tempted to enter a restaurant of the so-called western style, and so on and so on. He was in tremendous form, but has he ever been abroad? Waverhouse abroad? Of course not. He's got the money and time. If he wanted to, he could go off any time. He probably just converted his future intention to travel into the past tense of widely travel experience as a sort of joke. The master flatters himself that he says something witty and laughs invitingly. His guest looks largely unimpressed though. I see. I wonder when he had been abroad. I took everything he said quite seriously. Besides, he described such things as snail soup and stewed frogs, as though he had really seen them with his two own very eyes. He must have heard about them from someone. He's adept at such terminological inexact inexactitudes. So it would seem, and Beauchamp stares down at the narcissist in, in the vase, he seems a little disappointed. So... That then was his ingenious idea, I take it, asked the master, still in quest of un still in quest of certainties. No, that was only the beginning, the main part still to come. Ah the master utters in an interjection mingled with curiosity. Having finished the dissertation on matters of gastronomical and European, he proposed since it's quite possible to obtain snails or frogs, however much we may desire them, let's at least have moat bells. What do you say? And without really giving matter any thought at all, I answered, yes, that would be fine. Moat bells sounds a little odd. Yes, very odd. But because Waver House was speaking so seriously, I didn't even notice the oddity. He seems to be apologizing to my master for his carelessness. What happened next? Asked my master, quite indifferently, without any sign of sympathetic response to his guest's implied apology. Well then, he told the waiter, I'm sorry, can y'all stop changing costumes? <laughs> the sound is very... This distracting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um What happened next? asked my master quite indifferently, and with without any sign of sympathetic response to his guest implied apology. 
Well, he then told the waiter to bring his moat bells for two. The waiter said, Do you mean meatball, sir? But Waverhouse, assuming an ever more serious expression, corrected him with gravity. No, not meatballs, moat bells. Really? There is such dish called moat bells? Well, I thought it sounded somewhat strange, but as Waverhouse was so calmly sure that, and is so great at authority on all things occidental, remember, it was then my firm belief that he was widely travelled. I too joined in and explained to the waiter, Moat bells, my good man, moat bells. What did the waiter do? The waiter... It's really rather funny now one comes to think back on it. Looked thoughtful for a, for a while and then said, I'm terribly sorry, sir, but today, unfortunately, we have no moat bells. Though, should you care for meatballs, we could serve you, sir, immediately. Waver House thereupon looked extremely put out and said, So we have come all this long way for nothing. Could you really manage moat couldn't you manage, really manage more bells? Please do see what can be done. And he slipped a small tip to the waiter. The waiter said he would ask the cook again and went off into the kitchen. He must have had his mind dead set on eating moat bells. After a brief interval, the waiter returned to say that if moat bells were ordered specially, they could be provided, but it would take a long time. Waver House was quite composed. He said, It's the new year and we are no and we are in no kind of hurry, so let's wait for it. He drew a cigar from the inside of his western suit and lighted up in the most leisurely manner. I felt called upon to match his cool composure, so taking the Japan news from my kimono jack pocket, I started reading it. The waiter retired for further consultations. What business? My master leans forward, showing quite as much enthusiasm as he does when reading war news in the dailies. The waiter re-emerged with apologies and the confession that, of late, the ingredients of moat bells were in such short supply that one could not get them at Kamea's, nor even down at number 15 in Yokohama. He expressed regret. But it seemed certain that the material for moat bells would not be back in stock for some considerable time. Waverhouse then turned to me and repeated over and over again, What a pity! We came especially for that dish! I felt that I had to say something, so I joined him in saying, Yes, it's a terrible shame, really a great, great pity. Quite so, agrees my master. Though... I myself don't follow his reasoning. These observations must have made the waiter quite feel quite sorry, for he said, When one of these days we do have the necessary ingredients, we'll be happy if you could come, sir, and sample our fare. But when Waver House proceeded to ask him what ingredients the restaurant did use, the waiter just laughed and gave no answer. Waver House then pressingly inquired if the key ingredient happened to be Tochian, who, as you know, is a haiku poet of the Nihon school. And do you know the waiter answered? Yes, it is, sir. And that is precisely why none is currently available, even in Yokohama I am indeed, he added, most regretful, sir. <laughs> so that's the point of the story? How very funny! The master and the master, quite unlike his usual self, roars with laughter. His knees shake so much that I nearly tumble off, paying no regard paying no regard to my predicament, and the master laughs and laughs. He seems suddenly displeased. He seems suddenly pleased to realize that he is not alone in being gulled by Andrea del Sarto. And then, as soon as we are out in the streets, he said, You see, we've done well. That ploy about the moat bells was, rather, was really rather good, wasn't it? And he looked as pleased as Punch. I let it be known that I was lost in admiration, so we parted. However, 
Since by then it was well past the lunch hour, I was nearly starving. Oh, oh my god. Ah! Hi, hi! <laughs> welcome, welcome! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> that must have been very trying for you, my master shows for the first time, a sympathy to which I have no objection. For a while, there was a pause in the conversation, and my purring could be heard by hosts and guests. Mr. Beauchamp drains his cup of tea, now quite cold, in one quick gulp with, a, with some formality remarks. As a matter of fact, I've come today to ask a favor from you. Yes? What can I do for you? My master too assumes a formal face. As you know, I'm a devotee of literature and art. That's a good thing, replies my master quite encouragingly. Since a little while back, I and a few like-minded friends have got together and organized a reading group. The idea is to meet once a month for the purpose of continued studying in this field. In fact, we have already had the first meeting at the end of the year. May I ask you a question? When you say like that, a reading group, it suggests that you engage in reading poetry and prose in a sing-song tone. What in sort of manner do you, in fact, proceed? Well, we are in beginning of ancient works, and but we intend to consider the works of our fellow members. When you speak of ancient works, do you mean something like Po Chui's lute songs? No, perhaps something like Buson's mixture of haiku and Chinese verse? No. What kind of thing do you do then? The other day, we did one of Chikamatsu's lover suicides. Chikamatsu? You mean the Chikamatsu who wrote Joruri's place? There are no Chika. There are no two Chikamatsus. When one says Chikamatsu, one does indeed mean Chikamatsu the playwright and could mean nobody else. I thought my master really stupid to ask such a fool a question. However, Oblivious to my natural reactions, he gently strokes my head. I calmly let him go on stroking me, justifying my compliance with the reflection that so small a weakness is permissible when there are those in the world who admit to thinking to themselves under loving observation by persons who merely happen to be cross-eyed. Beauchamp answers, Yes, and tries to read the reactions on my master's face. <laughs> then, is it one person who reads or do you allot parts among you? We allot parts each and each reads out the appropriate dialogue. The idea is to empathize with the characters in the play and above all, to bring out their individual personalities. We do gestures as well. The main thing is to catch the essential character of the era of the play. Accordingly, the lines are read out as if spoken by each character which may perhaps be a young lady, or possibly an errand boy. In that case, it must be like a play. Yes, almost like, almost the only thing missing are the costumes and the scenery. May I ask if your reading was a success? For a first attempt, I think one might claim that it was, if anything, a success. And which lover suicide play did you perform on last occasion? We did a scene in which a boatman takes fares to the red light corridors of Yoshiwara. You certainly picked on the most irregular incident, didn't you? My master, being a teacher, tilts his head a little sideways as if regarding something slightly doubtful. The secret smoke drifting from his nose passes up by his ear and along the side of his head. No, it isn't that irregular. 
The characters are a passenger, a boatman, and a high-class prostitute, a serving girl, an ancient crone of a brothel attendant, and of course, a geisha register. But that's all. Beauchamp seems utterly unperturbed. My master, on hearing the words a high-class prostitute, winces slightly, but pos probably only because he's not well up in the meanings of such technical terms as Nakai, Yarite, and Kemban. He seeks to, to clear the ground with a question. Does not Nakai signify something like a maid servant in a brothel? Though I have not been I have not yet given the matter my full attention, I believe that Nakai signifies a serving girl in a tea house and a Yarite is some sort of an assistant in the women's quarters. Although Beauchamp recently claimed that his group seeks to impersonate the actual voices of the characters in the plays, he does not seem to have fully grasped the real nature of Yarite and Nakai. I see. Nakai belongs to a tea house while Yarite lives in a brothel. Next, are Kemban human beings or is the name of a place? If human, are they men or women? Kemban, I rather think, is a male human being. What is his function? I have not yet studied that far, but I'll make inquiries one of these days. Thinking in the light of these revelations, that the play readings must be affairs extraordinarily ill-conducted. I glance up at my master's face. Surprisingly, I find him looking serious. Apart from yourself, who were the other readers taking part? A wide variety of people. Mr. K, a bachelor of law, played the high-class prostitute. But his delivery of that woman's sugary dialogue through his very male moustache did, I confess create a slightly queer impression. And then, there was a scene in which this Oiran was seized with spasms. Do your readers extend their reading activities to the simulation of spasms? Asked my master anxiously. <laughs> yes, indeed. For expression is, after all, important. Beauchamp clearly considers himself a literary artist a la entrance. Did he manage to have his spasms nicely? My master has made a witty remark. The spasms were perhaps the only thing beyond our capability at such a first endeavor. Beauchamp too is capable of wit. By the way, asked my master, what part did you take? I was the boatman. Really? You? The boatman? My master's tone was to suggest that if Beauchamp could be a boatman, he himself could be a geisha registrar. Switching his tone to one of simple candor, he then asked, what the Was the role of the boatman too much for you? Beauchamp does not seem to be particularly offended. Maintaining the same calm voice, he replies, As a matter of fact, it was because of this boatman that our precious gathering, though it went up like a rocket, came down like a stick. It so happened that four or five girl students are living in the boarding house next door to our meeting hall. I don't know how, but they found out when our reading was to take place. Anyway, it appears that they came and listened to us under the window of the hall. I was doing the boatman's voice, and just when I had warmed up, a warm up nicely and was really getting into the swing of it, perhaps my gestures were a little too over-exaggerated. The girl students, all of whom had managed to control their feelings up to that point, thereupon burst into a simultaneous calculations. I was of course surprised, and I was of course embarrassed, indeed, thus dampened. I could not find it in me to continue, so our meeting came to an end. If this were considered a success, even for a first meeting, what 
failure would have been like. I could not help laughing involuntarily. My Adam's apples made a rumbling noise. My master, who likes what he takes to be purring, strokes my head ever more and more gently. I'm thankful to be loved just because I laugh at someone, but at the same time, I feel quite uneasy. If this were considered a success, even for a first meeting, what would failure have been like? I could not help laughing. Involuntarily, my Adam's apples made a rumbling noise. My master, who likes what... Sorry. I was repeating that. What a very bad luck! My master offers condolences despite the fact that we are still in the congratulatory season of the new year. As for our second meeting, we intend to make a great advance and manage things in grand style. That, in fact, is the very reason for my call today. We would like you to join our group and help us. I can't possibly have spasms. My negative-minded master is already poised to refuse. No, you don't have to have spasms or anything like that. Here's a list of the patron members. So saying, Beauchamp very carefully produced a small notebook of purple color carrying wrapper. He opened the notebook, placed it in front of my master's knees. Will you please sign and make your seal mark here? I see that the book contains the names of distinguished doctors of literature and bachelors of arts of this present day, all neatly mastered in full force. Well, I wouldn't say I object to becoming a supporter, but what sort of obligations would I have to meet? My oyster-like master display his apprehensions. There's hardly any obligations. We ask nothing from you except a signature expressing your approval. Well, in that case, I'll join. As he realizes that there is no real obligations involved, he suddenly becomes light-hearted. His face assumes the expression of one who would sign even a secret commitment to engage in rebellion, provided it was clear that the signature carries no binding obligations. Besides, it is understandable that he should assent to so eagerly, for to be con included even by name only, among so many names of celebrated scholars, is a supreme honor for one who has never before had such an opportunity. Excuse me. And my master goes off to study. To fetch his seal, I am tipped to fall unceremoniously onto the matting. Beauchamp helps himself to a slice of sponge cake from the cake bowl and crams it into his mouth. For a while, he seems to be in pain, mumbling. For just for a second, I am reminded of my morning experience with the rice cake. My master reappears with his seal just as the sponge cake settles down in Beauchamp's bowels. My master does not seem to notice that a piece of sponge cake is missing from the cake bowl. If he does, I shall be the first to be suspected. Mr. Beauchamp, having taken his departure, my master re-enters the study where he finds on his desk a letter from his friend Waverhouse. I wish you a very happy new year. My master considers the letter to have started with an unusual seriousness. Letters from Waverhouse are seldom serious. The other day, for instance, he wrote a flake. As I am not in love with any woman, I receive no love letters from anywhere. As I am more or less alive, please set your mind at ease. Compared with which, this New Year's letter is exceptionally matter of fact. The letter reads on. I would like to come and see you, but I am very extremely busy every day because contrary to your negativism, I am planning to greet this New Year a year unprecedented in all history with a positive an attitude as is possible, hoping you will understand. My master quite understands, thinking that Waverhouse, being Waverhouse, must be quite busy having fun during the New Year season. 
the letter continues. Yesterday, finding a minute to spare, I sought to treat Mr. Beauchamp to a dish of moat bells. Unfortunately, due to a shortage of their ingredients, I could not carry out my intention. It was most regrettable. My master smiles, thinking that the letter is falling more into the usual pattern. The letter continues. Tomorrow, there will be a card party at a certain baron's house the day after tomorrow, a New Year's banquet at Society of Estates. And the day after that, a welcoming party for Professor Toribe. And on the day thereafter, my master finding it rather bore skips a few lines. The letter continues. So you see, because of these incessant parties, no song parties, haiku parties, tanka parties, even parties for new style poetry, so on and so on, I am perpetually occupied for quite some time. And that is why I am obliged to send you this New Year's letter instead of calling on you in person. I pray you will forgive me. Of course, you do not have to call on me. My master voices his answer to the letter. And then the letter continues. Next time that you are kind enough to visit me, I would like you to stay and dine. Though, there is no special delicacy in my poor larder. At least, I hope to be able to offer you some moat bells, and I am indeed looking forward to that pleasure. You're still brandishing that moat bells, muttered my master, who thinking the invitation an insult begins to feel indignant. The letter continues. However, because the ingredients necessary for the preparation of moat bells are currently in rather short supply, it may not be possible to arrange it, in which case I will offer you some peacock's tongues. Aha! So he's got two strings to his bow, thinks my master and cannot resist reading the rest of the letter. And the letter continues. As you know, the tongue meat of per peacock amounts to less than half of the bulk of a small finger. Therefore, in order to satisfy your gluttonous stomach, What a pack of lies, remarks my master in a tone of resignation. I think one needs to catch at least 20 or 30 peacocks. However, though one sees an occasion, occasional peacock, maybe two, at the zoo or at the Asakusa Amusement Center, there are none to be found at my poulterers, which is occasioning me pain, great pain. <sighs> you are having that pain of your own free will. My master shows no evidence of gratitude. The letter continues. The dish of peacock's tongues was once extremely fashionable. In Rome, when the Roman Empire was in full pride of its prosperity, how I have always secretly coveted after peacock's tongues and the acme of gastronomical luxury and elegance, you may very well imagine. I may very well imagine, may I? How ridiculous. My master is extremely cold. The letter continues. From that time forward, until about the 16th century, peacock was an indispensable delicacy at all banquets. If my memory serves me, when the Earl of Leicester invited Queen Elizabeth to Kenilsworth, peacock's tongues were on the menu. And in one of the Rembrandt's banquet scene, a peacock is clearly to be seen lying its pride upon the table. My master grumbles that if Waverhouse can find time to compose a history of eating of peacocks, he cannot really be so busy. Anyway, if I go on eating good food as I have been doing recently, I will doubtlessly end up one of these days with a sweet stomach like yours. Like yours is quite unnecessary. He has no need to establish me as the prototypical dyspeptic. Grumbles my master. The letter continues.
According to historians, the Romans held two or three banquets every day, but the consumption of such good food while sitting at a large table two or three times a day must produce in any man, however sturdy his stomach, disorders in the digestive functions. Thus nature has like you. Like you! Again! What impudence! said my master. The letter continues. But they who study long and hard simultaneously to enjoy both luxury and exuberant health considered it vital not only to devour disproportionately large quantities of delicacies but also to maintain the bowels in full working order. They, accordingly, devise a secret formula. Really? My master become enthusiastic. The letter continues. They invariably took a postprandial bath after the bath, utilizing methods whose secret has long, long been long lost. They proceeded to vomit up everything they had swallowed before the bath. Thus were the insides of their stomach kept unscrupulous kept scrupulously clean. Having so cleansed their stomach, they would sit down again at the table and there savor to the uttermost of the delicacies of their choice. Then they took a bath again and vomited once more. In this way, though they gorged on their favorite dishes to their heart's content, none of their internal organs suffered the least damage. In my humble opinion, this was in case a case it was indeed a case of having one's cake and eating it. They certainly seem to kill a two or more birds with one stone. My master's expression is one of envy. Hydration time! Thank you for the reminder! Alright, I'm back. Oh. Okay. The letter continues. Today, this 20th century, quite apart from the heavy traffic and the increased number of banquets, when our nation is in the second year of war against Russia, is indeed eventful. I... Consequently, firmly believe that the time has come for us, the people of this victorious country, to bend our minds to study the truly Roman art of bathing and vomiting. Otherwise, I am afraid that even the precious people of this mighty nation will in the very near future become like you, dyspeptic. What? Again like me? An annoying fellow! thinks my master. The letter continues. Now, suppose that we, who are familiar with all things occidental, by study of ancient history and legend contrive to discover the secret formula that, lost, that has long been lost, then to make use of it now in our Meiji era, would be an act of virtue. It would need potential misfortune in the bud, and moreover, it would justify our own very everyday life, which has been one of constant indulgence in pleasure. My master thinks all of this a trifle odd. The letter continues. Accordingly, 
I have now, for some time, have been digging into the relevant works of Gibbon, Mommsen, and Goldwyn Smith, but I am extremely sorry to report that, so far, I have gained not even the slightest clue to the secret. However, as you know, I am a man who, once set upon a course, will not abandon it until my project is achieved. Therefore, my belief is that a deep a rediscovery of the vomiting method is not too far off. I will let you know when it happens. Incidentally, I would prefer postponing the feast of moat bells and peacock tongues, which I've mentioned above, until the discovery has actually been made. Which would not only be convenient to me, but also to you, who suffers from a weak stomach. So he has been pulling my leg all along. This style of writing was so sober that I have read it all and took the whole thing seriously. Waver House must indeed be a man of leisure to play such a practical joke on me, said my master through his laughter. Several days pa then passed without my any particular event, thinking it too boring to spend one's time just watching the narcissus in a white vase gradually wither and the slow blossoming of a branch of the blue stem plum in another vase. I have gone around twice to look for thought shell, but both times unsuccessfully. Both times unsuccessfully. Sorry, I got distracted. On the first occasion, I thought she was just out. But on my second visit, I learned that she was ill. Hiding myself behind the epistra, behind a wash basin, I heard a following, the following conversation, which took place between the mistress and her maid on the other side of the sliding paper door. Is Tortishell taking her meal? No, madam. She's eaten nothing this morning. I've let her sleep on the quilt of the food warmer, well wrapped up. It does not sound as if they spoke of a cat. Tortishell is being treated as if she were a human. As I compare this situation with my own lot, I feel a lot I feel a little envious, but at the same time, I'm not displeased that my beloved cat should be treated with such kindness. That's bad. If she doesn't eat, she will only get weaker. Yes, indeed, madam. Even for me, if I don't eat for a whole day, I couldn't work at all the next day. The maid answers as though she recognized the cat as an animal superior to herself. Indeed. In this particular household, the cat may well be more important than the maid. Have you taken her to the doctor? Yes, and the doctor was really strange. When I went into his consulting room carrying tortoiseshell in my arms, he asked me if I caught a cold, and I tried to take my pulse. I said, no doctor, it is not me. Who is the patient? This is the patient, and I placed tortoiseshell on my knees. The doctor grinned and said he had no knowledge of the sicknesses of cats, and that if I just left it, perhaps it would get better. Isn't he too terrible? I was so angry that I told him, then please don't bother to examine her. She happens to be our precious cat. And I snuggled tortoiseshell back into the breast in my kimono and came straight home. Truly so, truly so, is one, of the, is one of those elegant expressions that one would never hear in my house. One has to be the 13 shogun's widow's wife, somebody, something to be able to use such phrase. I was very much impressed by its refinement. She seems to be sniffling. Yes. I'm sure she's got a cold and a sore throat. Whenever one has a cold, one suffers from an honorable cough. One be a, one as might expect it from the maid of the thirteen shoguns besides something something she's quick with honorifics. Besides, recently there's a thing they call consumption. 
Indeed, these days one cannot be too careful. What with the increase in all these new diseases like tuberculosis and the Black Plague, things that did not exist in the days of Shogunate are all no good to anyone, so you be careful too. Is that so, madam? The maid is much moved. I don't see how she could have caught a cold. She hardly ever went out. No, but you see, she recently acquired a bad friend. The maid is as highly elated as if she was telling a state secret. A bad friend? Yes, the tatty looking Tom at the teacher's ha house in the main street. Do you mean the teacher who makes rude noises every morning? Yes, the one who makes it sound like a goose being strangled every time he washes his face. The sound of a goose being strangled is a clever description. Every morning when my master gargles in the bathroom, he had an odd he had an odd habit of making a strange, unceremonious noise by tapping his throat with his toothbrush. When he is in a bad temper, he croaks with a vengeance. When he's in a good temper, he gets so pepped up that he croaks even more vigorously. In short, whether he's in a good or bad temper, he croaks continually and vigorously. According to his wife, until they move into this house, he never had the habit. But he has done it every day since the day he first happened to do it. It is rather a trying habit. We cats cannot even imagine why he should persist in such behavior. Well, let that pass. What a scathing remark about the tatty looking Tom. I continue to eavesdrop. What good can... What good can he do making those noise? Under the shogunate even, a lackey or a sandal carrier knew how to behave, and in a residential quarter, there was no one who washed his face in such manner. I'm sure there wasn't, madam. The maid is all too easily influenced, and she uses madam far too often. With a master like that, what's to be expected from his cat? It can only be a stray. If he comes around here again, beat him. Most certainly I'll beat him. It must be all his fault that Tortishell is so poorly. I'll take it out on him, that I will. How far is this accusation laid against me? But judging it's rash to approach too closely, I came home without seeing Tortishell. When I return, my master is in his study, meditating in the middle of writing something. If I told him what they say about him in the house of the two-string harp, he would be very angry. But, as the saying goes, ignorance is bliss. There he sits, posing like a sacred poet, groaning. Just then, Waverhouse, who has expressively stated in his near letter that he would be too busy to call for some long time, dropped in. Are you composing a new style poem or something? Show it to me if you are, if it's interesting. I consider it rather, I consider it rather impressive prose, so I thought I would translate it, answers my master somewhat reluctantly. Prose? What prose? Don't know who's. I see. An anonymous author. Among anonymous art works, there are indeed some extremely good ones. They are not to be slighted. Where did you find it? The second reader, answered my master with an imperturbable calmness. Imperturbable calmness. The second reader? What's this got to do with the second reader? The connection is that the beautifully written article which I am translating appears in the second reader. Stop talking rubbish. I suppose this is the, your idea of last, the last minute squaring of accounts for the peacock's tongues. I'm not a braggart like you, says my master and twists his moustache. 
he is perfectly composed. Once, when someone asked Sanyo whether he had lately seen any fine pieces of prose, that celebrated scholar of the Chinese classic produced a dunning letter from a pack horseman and said, This is easily the finest piece of prose that recently come to my attention, which implies that your eye for the beautiful might contrary to one's expectation actually be accurate. Read your piece aloud, I'll review it for you, says Waverhouse, as if he were the originator of all aesthetic theories and practice. My master starts to read in the voice of a Zen priest reading the injunction left by the most reverend priest Daito, giant gravitation, he intoned. What on earth is giant gravitation? Giant gravitation is the title. An odd title, I don't quite understand. The idea is that there's a giant whose name is gravitation. A somewhat unreasonable idea, but since it's a title, I'll let that pass. Alright, carry on with the text. You have a good voice, which makes it rather interesting. Right, but no more interruptions. My master, having laid down his prayer conditions, begins to read. Kate looks out of the window. Children are playing ball. They throw the ball high up in the sky. The ball, the ball rises up and up. After a while, the ball comes down. They throw it high again. Twice, three times, every time they throw it up, the ball comes down. Kate asks why it comes down instead of rising up and up. It is because a giant lives in the earth, replies the mother. He is the giant gravitation. He is strong. He pulls everything towards him. He pulls the houses to the earth. If he didn't, they would fly away. Children, too, would fly away. You have seen leaves fall, haven't you? That's because the giant called them. Sometimes you drop a book. It's because giant gravitation asks for it. A ball goes up in the sky. The giant calls for it. Down it falls. Is that all? Yes. Isn't it good? Alright, you win. I wasn't expecting such a present in return for the moat bells. It wasn't meant as a return present or anything like that. I translated it because I thought it was good. Don't you think it's good? My master stares deep into the gold rim spectacles. What a surprise to think of to think that you of all people had this talent. Well, well, I've certainly taken in right and proper this time. I take my hats off to you. He is alone in his understanding. He is talking to himself. The situation is quite beyond my master's scraps. I have no intention of making you doff your cap. I translated this text simply because I thought it was an interesting piece of writing. Indeed, yes, most interesting, quite as it should be, smashing, I feel small, yeah. You, you don't have to feel small. Since I recently gave up painting in watercolors, I've been, th I've been thinking and trying my hand at writing. And compared with your watercolors, which showed no sense of perspective, no appreciation of differences in tone, your writing are superb. I am lost in admiration. Such encouraging words from you are making me positively enthusiastic about it, says my master, speaking from under his continuing mis misapprehension. Just then, Mr. Cole Moon enters with the usual greeting. Why, hello, responds Waverhouse. I've just been listening to a terrifically fine article and the curtain has been run down 
upon my moat bells. He speaks obliquely about something incomprehensible. Have you really? The reply. The reply is equally incomprehensible. It's only my master who seemed not to be in particularly light humor. The other day he remarked, A man called Beauchamp Blonlam came to see me with an introduction from you. Ah, did he? Beauchamp's an uncommonly ominous person, but as he is also somewhat odd, I was afraid that he might make himself a nuisance to you. However, since he had pressed me so hard to be introduced to you, not specially a nuisance. Didn't he, during his visit, go on a length about his name? No, I don't recall him doing so. No? He's got a habit at first meeting of expatiating upon the singularity of his name. What is the nature of that singularity? But in Waver House, who has been waiting for something to happen, he gets terribly upset if someone pronounces Beauchamp as Bicham. Odd, said Waverhouse, taking a pinch of tobacco from his gold-painted leather tobacco pouch. Invariably, he makes the immediate point that his name is not Bisham Blowlam, but Beauchamp Blowlam. That's strange, and Waverhouse inhales pricey tobacco smoke deep into his stomach. It comes entirely from his craze for literature. He likes the effect and is inexplicably proud of the fact that his personal name and his family can be made to rhyme with each other. That's why when one pronounces Beauchamp incorrectly, he grumbles that no one does not appreciate what he's trying to get across. He certainly is extraordinary. Getting more and more interested, Waverhouse hauls back the pipe smoke from the bottom of his stomach to let it loose at his nostrils. The smoke gets lost en route and seems to be snagged in his gullet. Transferring the pipe to his hand, he coughs chokingly. When he's here the other day, he said he had taken the part of a boatman at a meeting of his reading society that he has gotten himself laughed at by a gaggle of schoolgirls, says my master with a laugh. Ah, that's it, I remember. Waverhouse taps his pipe upon his knees. This strikes me as likely to, be, to prove dangerous, so I move a little f way further off. That reading society now. The other day, I treated him to moat bells. He mentioned it. He said they were going to make their second meeting a grand affair by inviting well-known literary men and cordially invited me to attend. When I asked him if they would again try another Chikamatsu's drama of popular life, he said no and that they had decided on a fairly modern play, The Golden Demon. I asked him what role he would take, and he said, I'm going to play Omiya. Beauchamp as Omiya would certainly be worth seeing. I'm determined to attend the meeting in his support. It's going to be interesting, I think, says Colmun, and he laughs in an odd way. But he is so thoroughly sincere, which is good, and has no hint of frivolousness about him, Quite different from Waver House, for instance. My master is revenge for Andrea del Sarto, for peacock tongues, and for moat bells all in one go. But Waver House appears to take no notice of the remark. Ah well, when all's said and done, I'm nothing but a chopping board at Yotoku. Yes, that's about it, observed my master. Although, in fact, he does not understand Waver House involved method in describing himself as a highly sophisticated simpleton. But not for nothing has he been so many years a school teacher. He is skilled in prevarication and his long experience in the classroom can be usefully applied in such awkward moments in social life. What's a chopping board at Gyotoku? asked the guiltless Colmun. My master looks towards the alcove, 
pulverizes at the chopping board at Gyotoku by saying, The Nasisai are lasting well. I bought them on my ho way home from the public baths towards the end of last year. Which reminds me, says Waverhouse, twirling his pipe, that at the end of last year, I had, I had a really most extraordinary experience. Tell us about it. My master, confident that the chopping board is now safely back in Gyotoku, heaves a sigh of relief. <sighs> the extraordinary experience of Mr. Waverhouse thus fell upon a fell thus upon our ears. If I remember correctly, it was on the twentieth. It was on the twenty seventh of December. Beauchamp had said it would like, he would like to come and hear me talk upon matters of literary, and had asked me to be sure to be in. Accordingly, I waited for him all morning, but he failed to turn up. I had lunch, and was seated in front of the stove reading one of Paine's humorous books, and when letter, when a letter arrived from my mother in Shizuoka. She, like all old women, still thinks of me as a child. She gives me all sorts of advices that I mustn't go out at night when the weather's cold, that unless the room is first heated with a stove, I'll catch my death of cold every time I take a bath. We owe so much to our parents, but who but a parent would think of me with such solicitude? Though normally I take things lightly, and as they come, I confess that at the juncture, the letter affected me deeply, for it struck me that to idle my life away, as indeed I do, was rather a waste. I felt that I must win honor for my family by producing a masterwork of literature or something like that. I felt. I would like the name of Dr. Waverhouse to become renowned, that I should be acclaimed as a leading figure in Meiji liter literary circle while my mother is still alive. Continuing my perusal of the letter, I read, You are indeed lucky. While our young people are suffering great hardships for the country in the war against Russia, you are living in a happy-go-lucky idleness, as if life were a long, were one long New Year party organized for your particular benefit. Benefits. Actually, I am not as idle as my mother thinks. But then, she continued to list the names of my classmates at elementary school who had either died or had been wounded at the present war. As one after another I read those names, the world grew hollow, all human life quite futile. She ended her letter by saying, Since I'm getting old, perhaps this New Year rice cakes will be my last. You will understand that, as she wrote so dishearteningly, I grew more and more depressed and began to yearn for Beauchamp to come home to come soon, but somehow he didn't, and at last it was time for supper. I thought of writing in reply to my mother, and I actually wrote about a dozen lines. My mother's letters were more than six feet long, but unable to match such a prodigious performance, I usually excused myself after writing ten lines. As I had been sitting down for the whole day, my stomach felt strange and heavy, thinking that if Beauchamp did turn up, he could jolly well wait, and I went out for a walk to post my letter. Instead of going toward the Fujimicho, which is my usual course, I went without knowing it, out towards the third embankment. It was a little cloudy that evening, and... A dry wind was blowing across the other side of the moat. It was terribly cold. A train coming from the direction of Kagurazaka passed with a whistle along the lower part of the blank. I felt very lonely. The end of the year, those deaths, 
at the battlefield, senility, life's insecurity, that time and tide wait for no man, and other thoughts of a similar nature ran around in my head. One often talks about hanging oneself, but I was beginning to think that one could not be tempted to commit suicide just at such a time as this. It so happened that at the moment, I raised my head slightly and as I looked up to the top of the bank, I found myself standing right below the very pine, very pine tree. That very pine tree? What's that? Cuts my master. The pine for hanging heads, says Waverhouse, ducking his noddles. Isn't the pine for hanging heads at Konodai? Cold moon amplifies the, the ripple. The pine at Konodai is the pine for hanging temple bells. The pine at Dote Sambancho is the one for hanging heads. The reason why it has acquired this name is that an old legend says that anyone who finds him under this pine tree is stricken with a desire to hang himself. Though there are several dozen pine trees on the bank, every time someone hangs himself, it is invariably on this particular tree that the body is found dangling. I can assure you there are at least two or three such danglings every year. It would be unthinkable to go and dangle on any other tree, pine tree. As I stared at the tree, I noted that the branch stuck out conveniently towards the pavement. Ah, what an exquisite fashion branch. It would be a real pity to leave it as it is. I wish so much that I could arrange for some human body to be suspended there. It can't be helped. Shall I hang myself? No, no, if I hang myself, I'll lose my life. I won't because it's dangerous. But I've heard a story that an ancient Greek used to entertain a banquet party by giving demonstrations of how to hang oneself. A man who would stand on a stool and at the very second that he put his head through the noose, a second man would kick the stool from under the under him. The trick was to the trick was that the first man would loosen the knot in the rope just as his stool was kicked away and dropped down a harm. If this story is really true, I've no need to be frightened. So thinking I might try to trick myself, I placed my hand on the branch and find it bent in a manner precisely appropriate. Indeed, the way it bends is positively aesthetic. I feel extraordinarily happy as I try to picture myself floating on this branch. I felt I simply must try it. But then I began to think that it would be inconsiderate if Beauchamp were waiting for me. Right. I must first see Beauchamp and then have the chat that I promised him. Thereafter, I would come out again. So thinking, I went home. And that is a happy ending to your story? Asked my master. Very interesting, says Komu with a broad grin. When I got home, Beauchamp had not arrived. Instead, I found a postcard from him saying that he was very sorry he could not keep our appointment because of some pressing matter, but unexpected happening, and that he was looking forward to having a long interview with me in the near future. I was relieved, I felt happy, for now I could hang myself with an easy mind. Accordingly, I hurried back to the same spot, and then Waverhouse, assuming a nonchalant air, gazes at Cole Moon and my master. And then what happened? My master is becoming a little impatient. I need to hydrate.
Hello, I'm back. Sorry, it took a little bit longer because I wanted to give my cat a pet. Um, we have about 11 pages left to chapter 2. So today we are going to run a bit longer than 2 hours of reading. And uh, I should be fine. Um, I'm fine. I hope that you all can stay with me today. And uh, finish up chapter 2 with me. And so that next time I can start with chapter 3. Okay? <clears throat> and now I shall continue. And then what happened? My master is becoming a little impatient. We have now come to the climax, says Kolmun, as he twists the string of his circle. And then... Somebody had beaten me to it, and had already hanged himself. I'm afraid I missed the chance just by a second. I see now that I had been the grip of the god of death. William James, the eminent philosopher, would no doubt explain that the region of the dead in the world is one subliminal consciousness that the real world in which I actually exist must have interacted in mutual response in accordance with some kind of law of cause and effect. But it really was extraordinary, wasn't it? Waver House looked quite demure. My master, thinking that he has again been taken in, says nothing but cramps his mouth with bean jam cake and mumbles incoherently. Coleman carefully rakes smooth the ashes in brazier and casts down his eyes, grinning, eventually opens his mouth, speaks in an extremely quiet tone. It is indeed so strange that it does not seem a thing likely to happen, but on the other hand, because I myself have recently had a similar kind of experience, I can readily believe it. What? Did you want to stretch your neck too? No, no, mine wasn't a hanging matter. It seems all the more strange that it also happened in the end of last year. At about some time in and on the same day as the extraordinary experience of Mr. Waverhouse. That's interesting, says Waverhouse, and he too stuffs his mouth with a bean jam cake. On the day, there was a year-end party combined with a concert given at the house of a friend of mine at Mukojima. I went there taking my violin with me. It was a grand affair of 15 or 16 young and married ladies. Everything was perfectly arranged for one felt it was most brilliant event of recent times. When the dinner and the concert were over, we sat and talked. And as I was about to take my leave, the wife of a certain doctor came up to me and asked in a whisper if I know that Miss O was unwell. A few days earlier, when I last saw Miss O, she had been looking well and normal. So I was surprised to hear this news, and my immediate question elicited the information that she had become feverish on the very evening of the day when I had last seen her, and that she was saying all sorts of curious things in her delirium. What was worse, every now and then in that delirium, we, she was calling my name. Not only my master, but even Waver House refrained from making any such hackneyed remark as You lucky fellow. They just listened in silence. They fetched a doctor who examined her. According to the doctor's diagnosis, though the name of the disease was unknown, the high fever affecting the brain had made her condition dangerous unless administration of sulfurifics worked as effectively as to be hoped for. As soon as I heard this news, a feeling of something awful grew within me. It was a heavy feeling, as though one were having a nightmare, and all the surrounding air seemed suddenly to be solidifying like a clamp upon my body. On my way home, moreover, I found I could think of nothing else, and it hurt that beautiful, that gay, that so healthy Miss O. 
Just a minute, please. You have mentioned Miss O about two times. If you have no objection, we'd like to know her name, wouldn't we? Asked Waverhouse, turning to look at my master. The, late, the latter evades the question and says, Hmm. No. I won't tell you her name since it might compromise the person in question. Do you then propose to recount your entire story in such vague, ambiguous, equivocal, and non committal terms? You mustn't sneer. This is a very serious story. Anyway, the thought of that young lady suffering from such odd an ailment filled my heart with mournful emotion and my mind with sad reflections on the ephemeral, ephemerality of life. I felt suddenly depressed beyond all saying, as if every last ounce of my vitality had just like that evaporated from my body. I staggered on, tottering and wobbling, until I came to the Azuma Bridge. As I looked down, leaning on the parapet, the black waters at Nip or Ebb, I don't know which, seems to be coagulating, only just barely moving. A rickshaw coming from the direction of Hana Kawado ran over the bridge. I watched its slam grow smaller and smaller until it disappeared at the Sapporo Beer Factory. Again, I looked down at the water, and at that moment, I heard a voice upstream calling my name. It is most improbable that anyone should be calling after me at this unlikely time of the night, and wondering whom it could possibly be. I peered down to the surface of the water, but I couldn't see any anything in the darkness. Thinking it must have been my imagination, I had decided to go home. When I heard again the voice calling my name, I stood dead still and listened. When I heard it calling me for the third time, though I was gripping the parapet firmly, my knees began to tremble uncontrollably. The voice seemed to be coming either from far away or from, from the bottom of the river, but it was unmistakable of the voice of Miss O. In spite of myself, I answered, Yes! My answer was so loud that it echoed back from the still water, and surprised by my own voice, I looked around me in a startled matter. There was no one to be seen. No dog. No moon. Nothing. At this very second, I experienced a sudden urge to emerge myself in the total darkness from which the voice had summoned me, and once again the voice of Miss O pierced into my ears painfully, appealingly, as if begging for help. This time I cried, I'm coming now, and leaning well out over the parapet, I looked down into the somber depth. For it seemed to me that the summoning voice was surging powerfully up from beneath the waves, thinking that the source of the pleading must lie in the water directly below me. I, at last, managed to clamber onto the parapet. I was determined that next time the voice called out to me, I would dive straight in, and as I stood watching the stream, once again, the thin thread of the pitiful voice came floating up to me. This, I thought, is it. Jumping high, and with all my strength, I came dropping down without regret like a pebble or something. So, you actually did dive in? Asked my master, blinking his eyes. I never thought you would go as far as that, says Waverhouse, pinching the tip of his nose. After my dive, I became unconscious, and for a while, I seemed to be living in a dream, but eventually I woke up, and though I felt cold, I was not at all wet, and I did not as if I had swallowed any water, yet I was sure I had dived. How very strange! 
realizing that something peculiar must have taken place, I look around me and receive a real shock. I had meant to dive into the water, but apparently I had accidentally landed in the middle of the bridge itself. I felt abysmally regretful, having by sheer mistake jumped backwards instead of forwards. I had lost my chance to answer the summons of the voice. Komun smirks and fiddles with the strings of his surcoat as if they were in some way irksome. <laughs> How very comical! It's odd that your experience so much resembles mine. It too could be adduced in support of theories of Professor James. If you were to write it up in an article entitled The Human Response, it would astound the whole literary world. But what persisted Waverhouse became of ailing Miss O. When I called at her house a few days ago, I saw her just inside the gate, playing battle door and shuttlecock with her maid, so I expected. She had completely recovered from her illness. My master, who for some time had been deep thought, finally opens his mouth and in a spirit of unnecessary rivalry remarks, I too have a strange experience. You've got what? In Waver's house view, my master counts for, lit for so little that he's scarcely <laughs> entitled to have experiences. Mine had also occurred at the end of last year. It's queer, observed Coleman, that all last year and he sniggers. A piece of bean jam cake adheres to the corner of his chipped front tooth. And it took place, doubtless, at the Waver House at the very same time, on the very same day. No, I think the date is different. It's about the 20th. My wife had earlier asked me, as a year-end's present to herself, to take her to hear Setsu Daijo. I replied that I wouldn't say no, and I asked her. One moment, please. I need a quick hydration, sorry. I'm back, sorry. <sighs> okay. My wife had earlier asked me as a year end's present to herself to take her to hear Setsu Daijo. I replied that I wouldn't say no and I asked her the nature of the program for the day. She consulted the newspapers and answered that it was one of Chikamatsu's suicide dramas, Unagi Dani. Let's not go today. I don't like unagidani, said I. So we did not go that day. Sorry. Sorry.
Hello, I'm back. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's not go today. I don't like Unagi Dani, said I. So we did not go that day. The next day, my wife bringing out newspaper again and said, Today, he's doing the monkey man at the Horikawa, so let's go. I said, let's not, because Horikawa was so frivolous, so shamisen playing with no meat in it. My, my wife went away discontented. The following day, she stated almost as a demand. Today's program is the temple with 33 pillars. You may dislike the temple quite strongly as you dislike all the others. But since the treat is intended to be for me, surely you won't object to taking me there. I responded, if you have set your heart on it so firmly, then we'll go. But since the performance had been announced as Setsu's farewell appearance on stage, the house is bound to be packed full. And since we haven't booked in advance, it will obviously be impossible to get in. To start with, in order to attend such performances, there is an established procedure to be observed. You have to go to the theatre tea house and there negotiate for a seat reservation. It would be hopeless to try going about it the wrong way. You can't dodge this proper procedure. So sorry though I am, we simply cannot go today. My wife's eyes glittered fiercely. Since I'm a weird, mere woman, I do not understand your complicated procedures. But both Ohare's mother and Kimiyo of the Suzuki's family managed to get in without observations of such formalities. And they heard everything very well. I realize you are a teacher, and surely you don't have to go through all that troublesome rigmarole just to visit a theater. It's too bad. Y you are so... And her voice became tearful. I gave in. All right. We'll go to the theater even if we can't get into it. After an early supper, we'll take the first tram. She suddenly became quite lively. If we are going, we must be there by 4 o'clock, so we mustn't dilly-dally. When I asked her why one has to be there by 4 o'clock, she explained that Kimio had told her that if one arrived any later, all the seats would be taken. I asked her again to make sh quite sure. If it would be fruitless to turn up later than 4 o'clock, and she answered briskly, Of course it would be no good. Then, do you know, at the very moment the shivering set in. Do you mean your wife? asked Coleman. Oh no! My wife was as spit as a fiddle. It was me. I had suddenly feeling... That I was shriveling like a prickled balloon. Then I grew giddy and unable to even move. You were taken ill with a most remarkable suddenness, comment Waver House. This is terrible. What should I do? I would like so much to grant my wife her wish, her one and only request in a whole long year. All I ever do is scold her fiercely and not speak to her or nag her about household expenses or insist that she cares more carefully for the children. Yet, I have never rewarded her for all her efforts in the domestic field. Today, luckily, I have the time and the money available. I could easily take her on some little outing and she very much wants to go, just as I very much want to take her. But much indeed I want to take her, this icy, shivering, frigidful giddiness make it impossible for me to even step down from the entrance of my own house, let alone climb up into a tram. The more I think how deeply I grieve for her, the poor thing, the worse my shivering grows and more giddy I become. I thought if I consulted a doctor and took some medicine, I might get well before 4 o'clock. 
and discuss the matter with my wife and send for Mr. Amaki, Bachelor of Medicine. Unfortunately, he had been on night duty at the university hospital and hadn't yet come home. However, we received every assurance that he was expected home by about 2 o'clock and that he would hurry around to see me, see me the minute he returned. What a nuisance. If only I could get some sedative, I know I could be cured before 4. But when luck is running against once, nothing goes well. Here I am, just once in a long time, looking forward to seeing my wife's happy smile and to be sharing in that happiness. My expectations seem sadly unlikely to be fulfilled. My wife, with a most reproachful look, inquires whether it is really impossible for me to go out. I'll go, certainly, I'll go, don't worry. I'm sure I'll be all right by four. Wash your face, get ready to go out and wait for me. Though I uttered all this reassurance, my mind shaken with profound emotions, the shivering strengthens and accelerates, and my giddiness grows worse and worse, unless I do get well by four o'clock and implements one my promise one can never tell such pusillanimous woman might do. What a wretched business! What should I do? As I thought it possible that the very worst could happen, I began to wonder whether perhaps it might be my duty as a husband to explain to my wife now while I was still in possession of my faculties. The dread truths concerning mortality and the vicissitudes of life for if the worst should happen, she would then at least be prepared and less liable to be to be overcome by the paroxysm of her grief. I accordingly summoned my wife to come immediately to my study, and when I began saying, Though but a woman, you must be aware of the Western proverb which states, There is many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. She flew into fury. How should I know anything about all such sideways written words? You are deliberately making a fool of me by choosing to speak English when you perfectly well I don't understand a word of it. All right, so I can't understand English. But if you are so besotted with about English, why didn't you marry one of those girls from the mission schools? I've never come across anyone quite so cruel as you. In the face of this tirade, my kindly feeling, my husbandly anxiety to prepare her for extremities were naturally damped down. I would like you to understand that it was not out of malice that I spoke in English. Those words sprang solely from sincere sentiment of my love for my wife. Consequently, my wife's malign interpretation of my motive left me feeling helpless. Besides, my brain was somewhat disturbed by reason of the cold shivering and the giddiness. On top of that, I was understandably distraught by the effort of trying quickly to explain to her the truth of mortality and the nature of vicissitudes of life. That was why, quite unconsciously and forgetting that my wife could not understand the tongue I spoke in English, I immediately realized I was in the wrong. It was entirely my fault. But, as a result of my blunder, the cold shivering intensified its violence, and my giddiness grew ever more viciously vertiginous. My wife, in accordance in, with my instructions, proceeds to the bathroom and stripping herself to the waist, completes her makeup, then taking a kimono from a drawer, she puts it on. Her, head, her attitude makes it quite clear that she is now ready to go out anytime and is simply waiting for me. I begin to get get nervous. Wishing that Mr. Amaki would arrive quickly, I look at my watch. It's already 3 o'clock. Only one hour to go. My wife slides open the study door and putting her head in asks, Shall we go now? It may sound silly to praise one's own wife, but I had 
never thought her quite so beautiful as she was at that moment. Her skin, thoroughly polished with soap, gleams deliciously and makes a marvelous contrast of the blackness of a silken circle. Her face has a kind of radiance both externally, externally and shining from within, partly because of the soap and partly because of her intense longing to listen to Setsu Daijo. I feel I must, come what may, take her out to satisfy that yearning. All right, perhaps I will make the awful effort to go out. I was smoking and thinking along this line when at long last Mr. Amaki arrived. Excellent. Things are turning out as one would wish for. However, when I told him about my condition, Amaki examined my tongue, took my pulse, tapped my chest, stroked my back, turned my eyelids inside out, patted my skull, and thereafter sank into deep thought for quite some time. I say to him, it is my impression that there may be some danger. But he replied, no, I don't think there's anything seriously wrong. I imagine it would be perfectly fine for him to go out a little? Asked my wife. Let me think. Amaki sank back into the profundities of thought, re-emerging to remark, Well, so as long he doesn't feel unwell. Oh, but I do feel unwell, I said. In that case, I'll give you a mild sedative and some liquid medicine. Yes, please. This is going to be something serious, isn't it? Oh no, it's nothing to worry about. You mustn't get nervous, said Amaki. And thereupon departed. It is now half past three. The maid was sent to fetch the medicine. In accordance with my wife's imperative instruction, the wretched girl not only ran the whole way there, but also the whole way back. It is now a quarter to four. Fifteen minutes to go. Then, quite suddenly, just about that time, I began to feel sick. It came on with quite an extraordinary suddenness, all totally unexpected. My wife had poured the medicine into a teacup, all total, and placed it in front of me. And as soon as I tried to lift the teacup, some cat cat thing stormed up from within the stomach. I am compelled to put the teacup down. Drink it up quickly, urges my wife. Yes, indeed, I must drink it quickly and go out quickly. Mustering all my courage to imbibe the potion, I bring the teacup to my lips when again that insuppressible keck keck thing prevents my drinking it. While this process of raising the cup, putting it down, is being several times repeated, the minute crept on until the wall clock in the living room struck four o'clock. Ting, 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 ting. Four o'clock it is. I can no longer dilly and dally, and I raise the teacup once again. Do you know it was the most strange? It really was most strange. I had said that it was certainly the uncanniest thing I've ever experienced. At the fourth stroke of my sickliness just vanished and I was able to take the medicine without any trouble at all. And by about 10 past 4, here I must add that I now realize for the first time how truly skilled a physician we have in Dr. Amaki, the shivering of my back and the giddiness and in my head had both disappeared like a dream. Up to that point, I had expected that I was bound to be laid up for days, but to my great pleasure, the illness proved to have been completely cured. And did you two then go out to the theatre? asked Waver House with a puzzled expression of one who cannot see the point of the story. We certainly both wanted to go, but since it had it had been my wife's reiterated view that there was no hope of getting in after 4 o'clock. What could we do? We didn't go. If only Amaki had arrived 15 minutes earlier, I could have 
kept my promise and my wife would have had been satisfied. Just that 15 minutes difference, I was indeed distressed. Even now, when I think how narrow the margin was, I am distressed. My master, having told his shabby tale, contrived to look like a person who has done his duty. I imagine he feels he has gotten even with the other two. How very vexing, says Cole Moon. His laugh, as usual, displayed his broken tooth. Waver House, with false naivety, remarks to himself, Your wife, with a husband so thoughtful and kind-hearted, is indeed a lucky woman. Behind the sliding door, we heard the master's wife making a harumphing noise as though clearing her throat. Welcome back! Okay. I have been quietly listening to the successive stories of these three precious humans, but I was neither amused nor saddened by what I had heard. I merely concluded that human beings were good for nothing, except for the strenuous employment of their mouth for the purpose of wailing away their time in laughter at things which are not funny and in the enjoyment of amusement which are not amusing. I have long known of my master's shelfishness and narrow-mindedness, but, but because he usually has little to say, there was always something about him which I could not understand. Mm. I don't know, maybe it's my internet. I had felt a certain caution, a certain fear, even a certain respect towards him on account of that aspect of his nature that I did not understand. But having heard his story, my uncertainty suddenly coalesced into a mere contempt for him. Why can't he listen to the stories of the other two in silence? What good purpose can he serve by talking such utter rubbish? Just because his competitive spirit has been roused, I wonder if in his portentous writings, Epictetus advocated any such course of action. In short, my master, Waver House, and Colmoon are like hermits in a peaceful reign, though they adopt nonchalant attitudes keeping themselves aloof from the crowd, segregated like so many snake gourds swayed lightly by the wind. In reality, they too are so shaken by just the same greed and worldly ambition as their fellow man. The urge to compete and their anxiety to win are revealed flickeringly in their everyday conversation, and only a hair breath separates them from the Philistines whom they spend their idle days denouncing. They are all animals from the same den. In fact, from a feline point of view, it is infinitely regrettable. Their only moderately redeeming feature is that their speech and conduct are less tediously uninventive than those of less subtle creatures. And thus, I sum up the nature of the human race. I suddenly felt the conversation of these specimens to be intolerably boring. So I went around to the garden of the mistress of the two-string harp to see how Tortoiseshell was getting on. The pine tree decorations for the new year and the season's sacred festoons have been taken down. It is 10th of January. From the deep sky containing not even a single streak of cloud, the glorious springtime shines down upon the lands and seas of the world, whole white world. So that even her tiny garden seems yet more brilliantly lively than it saw the dawn of New Year's Day. There is a cushion on the veranda. The sliding paper door is closed. There is nobody about, which probably means that the, mas the mistress has gone off to the public baths. I'm not all concerned if the mistress should be off, but I do very much worry whether Tortishell is any better. 
Since everything's so quiet and not a sign of a soul, I hop up onto the veranda with my muddy paw and curl right up in the middle of the cushion which I find comfortable. A drowsiness came over me and forgetting all about tortoiseshell, I was about to drop off into a doze when suddenly I heard voices beyond the paper door. Ah, thanks. Was it ready? The mistress had not, had not gone out at, after all. Yes, madam. I'm sorry to have taken such a long time. When I got there, the man who makes Woody's altar furniture told me he had only just finished it. Well, let me see it. Ah, but it's beautifully done. With this, tortoiseshell can surely rest in peace. Are you sure the gold won't peel away? Yes, I made sure of it. They said that they had used the very best quality. It would last longer than most human memorial tablets. They said that the character for honor in Tortoiseshell's posthumous name would look better if written in cursive style. So they had added the appropriate strokes. Is that so? Well, let's put Myo Yoshinyo's tablet in the family shrine and offered incense sticks. Has anything happened to Tortoiseshell? Thinking something must have been wrong, I stand up on the cushion. Ting! Amen, Myoyoshinyo, save us, merciful Buddha. May she rest in peace. It is the voice of the mistress. You too, say prayers for her. Ting! Amen, Myoyoshinyo. Save us, merciful Buddha. May she rest in peace. Suddenly, my heart throbs violently. I stand dead still upon the cushion like a wooden cat. Not even my eyes are moving. It's really a pity. It's only a call at first. Perhaps if Dr. Amaki had given her some medicine, it might have helped. It was indeed Amaki's fault. He paid little too little regard to tortoiseshell. You must not speak ill of other persons. After all, everyone dies when their allotted spend time is over. It seems that tortoiseshell was also attended by the skilled physician, Dr. Amaki. When all said and done, I believe the roots caused with a stray cat at the teachers in the main street took her out too often. Yes! That brute! I would like to exculpate myself. But I re realizing that this juncture it behoves me to be the patient, I swallowed hard and continued listening. There is a pause in the conversation. Life does not always turn out as one wishes, and beauty like tortoiseshell dies young. That ugly stray remains healthy and flourishes in devilment. It is indeed so, madam. Even if one such high and low for a cat as charming as tortoiseshell, one would never find another person like her. She didn't say another cat, she say another person. The maid seems to think that cats and humans are one of are of one race. Which reminds me the face of this particular maid straight strangely like a cat's. If only I would dear tortoiseshell. That wretched stray at the teacher's house. Teachers had been taken. That then, madam, how perfectly would have gone. If everything had gone that perfectly, I would have been in deep trouble. Since I have not yet had the experience of being dead, I cannot whether I cannot say whether or not I would like it. But on the other, it happening to be so unpleasantly chilly, I crept into the tub of for conserving half-used charcoal and settled down its still warm content. The maid, not realizing I was there, popped the lid. I shudder even now at the mere thought of the agony that I then suffered. According to Miss Blanc, the cat across the road, one dies if the agony continues even for a very short stretch. I wouldn't complain if I were to ask to substitute for tortoiseshell, but if one cannot die without going through that kind of agony, I frankly cannot die on behalf of anyone.
Though a cat, she had her funeral service conducted by a priest and now she has been given a posthumous Buddhist name. I don't think she would expect us to do more. Of course not, madam. She is indeed thrice blessed. The only more comment that one might think might make is that funeral service read by the priest was perhaps a little wanting in gravity. Yes, I thought it was rather too brief. When I remarked to the priest from the Gekke temple, you finished very quickly, haven't you? He answered, I've done sufficient of the effective parts, quite enough to get a kitty into paradise. Dear me! But if the cat in question were that unpleasant stray, I have pointed out often enough that I have no name, but this maid keep calling me that stray. She is a vulgar creature. So, very sinful creature, madam, would never be able to rest in peace, however many edifying texts will read for its salvation. I do not know how many hundreds of times I was thereafter stigmatized as a stray. I stopped listening to the endless babble while it was still only half run. And slipping down from the cushion, I jumped off from the veranda, then erecting every single of my 88,800 80 hairs, I shook my whole body. Since that day, I have not ventured near the mistress of the two strings harp. No doubt by now, she herself is having text inadequate gravity read on her behalf by the priest of the Gekke temple. Nowadays, I haven't even energy to go out. Somehow, life seems weary. I have become an indolent a cat as my master is an indolent human. I have come to understand that it is only natural that people should so often explain my master's self immurement in his study as a result of a love affair gone wrong. As I have never caught a rat, that all some person one proposed that I should be expelled, but my master knows that I am no ordinary common or garden cat. And that is why I continue to lead an idle existence in this house. For understanding, I am deeply grateful to my master. What's more, I take every opportunity to show the respect due to his per perspicacity. I do not get particularly angry with all some ill treatment of me, for she does not understand why I am as I am now. But when, one of these days, some master sculpture, some regular Hidari Jingoro, comes and carves my image on a temple gate when some Japanese equivalent of a French master portrait's stein line immortalizes my feature on a canvas. Then, at last, will the silly purblind beings in shame regret their lack of insight. And that is the end of chapter 2 of volume 1 of Natsume Soseki's I Am a Cat. <sighs> oh my god. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending my readings today. Thank you so so much. Thank you so much. All of you. Every one of you. For attending my... Oh, sorry. I'm really, 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 really thankful for every single one of you, even those who uh, has to go, uh, or even those on my Twitch who are not in my game, uh, who is not in game right now. 
thank you uh, for listening. Uh, it was supposed to be a two-hour read, but I think uh, the next read will be on this coming Thursday, also at 10 a.m. But I will not set it into a two-hour session because I think I'm going to do it by chapter instead. So I will finish a chapter for each reading. So on this coming Thursday, which is the um, uh, 24th of March uh, at 10 a.m., uh, I will be here. Uh, we'll make a. We'll. We'll. I think we should still be here in the same place. But yes, uh, on Twitch, I'll be streaming at the same time at 10 a.m. Uh, maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, you can catch me. Uh, we will continue reading I Am a Cat by Natsume Soseki, uh, the first volume, chapter 3. So, once again, thank you so much, everyone for dropping by and I hope you all have a wonderful day and uh, go have your lunch uh, eat well and have a great day <laughs> thank you and most of all thank you Dian. you are the very best you are the best mod anyone could ever have so Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so, so much, everyone. Thank you so much. I will see you all. I will switch off the stream right now, but I will restart my stream because I'm going to play the game. <laughs> to actually play the game, right? <laughs> so hang around. I'll see you guys around. Um, Nudible continues on this coming Thursday at 10 a.m. I'll see you again. Have a great day.